So in this last part of the lecture, I want to address some of the common misconceptions about evolution and also go through some of the evidence for the theory of evolution by natural selection. So the first common misconception is that evolution is goal-oriented. Evolution is not goal-oriented. Instead, evolution is just what happens in terms of gene frequencies to a population every generation. Species cannot decide to create a perfect organism. So natural selection can't say, oh, I would love to have wings and produce toxins. It can only act on existing variations in the population. So natural selection can create the best organism it can given the parts that that species has, but it isn't heading towards some perfect organism. And this is a concept that goes back to a proposal about evolution that came about before Darwin that was called Lamarckian evolution. And Lamarck thought that individuals could strive to become better. And we often depicted evolution as a ladder where individual species were moving up the ladder and becoming more and more sophisticated. But that ladder analogy is faulty in that it assumes one species is better than the other or more improved than the other. And remember, natural selection is just survival for an individual in a particular population, and evolution is the change in gene frequency that results from that. Finally, individuals cannot evolve. We use this term evolution in our everyday language. You're evolving as a student, as a human being, but that's different than biological evolution. My gene frequencies can't change, so evolution is something that happens to populations, not to individuals. Now natural selection acts on the individual, determining which individuals have more babies or less babies, and that results in evolution acting on the population overall. So the theory of evolution by natural selection is a theory because it's got a large body of evidence. So any one of these pieces of evidence might not be enough to support an entire theory, but they're from vastly different areas and they all come together to support the theory of evolution by natural selection. We've got different kinds of evidence, direct observations, we have the fossil record, we have homologies, embryology, vestigial structures, analogous structures, biogeography, and artificial selection. And I'm going to talk briefly about each one of these. We've actually observed natural selection happen. We've seen this with uh, antibiotic resistance with bacteria. You've got a whole bunch of bacteria and there's genetic diversity in the population. You subject them to antibiotics, drugs that kill bacterial cells specifically. Most of them die, but a few survive. And those ones that survive go on to have more babies. Even if this individual continues to take antibiotics, those resistant individuals will survive and eventually that antibiotic won't work on that particular bacteria anymore. In this case, the antibiotics themselves are the selective pressure that's pushing the evolution of this species. Now we can see this with bacteria because remember bacteria reproduce very quickly and so we can see this change happening. The fossil record. The fossil record shows extinctions. So it shows that there are species that used to exist on the planet that don't anymore. And it also shows changes within groups over time. It is important to recognize that the fossil record is very incomplete. In order for fossils to occur, you have to have hard parts in the body. Individuals have to fall into the right mud pit at the right time or be covered with the right uh, kinds of soil and pressure. So we don't have evidence of every piece, but we do have a decent idea about how life has changed over the 4.5 billion year history of the planet. 
homologies. Homologies are interesting evidence. They suggest common ancestry among different species. So you can have physical homologies like bone structures and you can have molecular homologies. You can look at how similar DNA or protein structures are between organisms and determine how closely related they might be. So here's an example of a physical homology. If you look at the arm of a human, front foot of a cat, flipper of a whale, and wing of a bat, all of these clearly have completely different functions. We have grabbing, running, swimming, and flying. But in fact, if you count the bones and look at them, you notice that they're all basically the same. They have the same number and same approximate location but they're modified for their particular function. So you could imagine maybe millions and millions of years ago some common ancestor that had this set of bones and populations were separated and the individuals who had this kind of bone setup survived better in certain environments. This in different environments and you end up with speciation over hundreds of thousands or millions of years. We can also look at molecular examples. Here is an example of the amino acid differences in hemoglobin. This is a protein that carries oxygen in your blood. And if we look at a human versus a macaque, there are only eight amino acid differences. I think this one has about 148 amino acids only eight differences and what that suggests is that somewhere back there there is a common ancestor not a species that exists anymore but a common ancestor that gave rise to these two groups dogs and humans 32 differences that means that we still have an ancestor in common but in terms of time it's farther back then we go all the way back to like a frog they have hemoglobin as well but they have 67 differences with our hemoglobin so we only share about half of our hemoglobin uh, molecule in common and that goes back even farther in geologic time so this is evidence of common ancestry embryology when we look at the development of organisms before they're born we can see anatomical homologies that aren't visible in adults and specifically here we're looking at a human and a chicken and both of us have a tail at some point in our development and both of us have gills at some point in our development now obviously neither of us need gills anymore and so for the mammals and the birds who are on land and don't need those gills to breathe underwater that tissue doesn't become lungs you don't change function in tissues like that but those tissues become modified later in the embryo's development to be what is our larynx or voice box so the vibrating bands of tissues that allow me to speak started out as gills when I was a 10 week old embryo A vestigial structure is a structure that an organism has that has no apparent use. And the theory explains that this could be a remnant of a feature that was important to the species uh, ancestor that it no longer uses. And this is evidence that species change over time. And there's a couple great examples of this. A classic one is that whales actually have pelvic bones and a hind leg bone. And obviously they don't have hind legs. But this suggests they evolved from something that did have a hind leg. We've got a little tailbone and this is evidence that we share a common ancestor that did have a tail. We're walking up right now and we don't need this for balance anymore. Analogous structures are when very different species develop similar structures because they live in similar environments and have similar selective pressures. Here we have an example of some wings and these wings all have similar bone structure and are probably somewhat homologous. But then we have a wing on an insect and it serves the same function as a bat wing but 
structurally it's completely different. The theory of evolution by natural selection predicts this and calls it convergent evolution. And it just says if organisms live in similar environments and have the same selective pressure, they may come up with similar uh, physical or behavioral solutions to whatever the issue is in their environment. This is the opposite of homologous structures and it doesn't provide ancestry information. Biogeography is the study of the distribution of species on the planet and the theory of evolution by natural selection is supported by biogeography in a couple key ways. So the theory of evolution by natural selection predicts that if you separate two populations, one on the island, one on the mainland, that you will get speciation. So islands are a great example of geographic isolation. The species of frogs that live here on the east coast of South America match the species of frogs that live here on the west coast of Africa. What this suggests is that in fact these two continents were connected. Uh, long back in geologic time. And if you remember one of the assumptions of the theory of evolution by natural selection is that the earth is very very old. It is more than 10,000 years old. And the occurrence of these frogs in these distant places is evidence that the earth is in fact much older than 10,000 years old. Frogs can't survive in salt water so they certainly didn't float across on rafts or something like that. Finally, we have artificial selection, and this is one of the things Darwin noticed. He's, he worked with uh, carrier pigeons. This is basically natural selection where the selective pressure is not predators or the temperature of the environment, but it's human preference. So farmers and breeders have already shown that they can rapidly change a kind of dog in this case or a form of corn through selective breeding. Pick certain individuals that look or produce a certain way and only breed those and we can rapidly change populations to look and act very differently. Which again is evidence that natural selection can in fact change organisms. And that's evolution and natural selection.